Topic Jehovah Nissi The Lord is our banner, the Lord is our victory. Our reading is Exodus 17 verse 1 to 16. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people did chide or did contend with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why do you chide or contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you smote the river, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb, and you shall smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding or contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek, and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us some men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur supported up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited or defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out, or blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Chapter 1. The Rephidim of Our Christian Pilgrimage The word Rephidim means balusters. In other words, many balusters have been placed around a location to form a balustrade, which is a row of balusters, joined by a rail serving as a fence. Rephidim, or Rephidium, is the plural of the word Rephida, which means bottom. Therefore, Rephidim also means bottoms. In our Christian pilgrimage, we might find ourselves in places we do not like. It may seem to us as if we have reached the bottom of the bottomless pit. We do not know how we will ever come out of that bottomless pit. We have nobody to help us. We have nobody to provide for us. We have nobody to vouch for us, etc. Here we see the children of Israel in the wilderness. They arrived at Rephidim, and they did not know how their thirst would be quenched in the wilderness. They felt like they had reached the bottom, not just were they in the wilderness and not in the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, but they were about to die of thirst. They cried out to Moses, Give us water to drink. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? Coming out of Egypt corresponds to our salvation. 
when we became born again, and going through the Red Sea corresponds to our baptism, death, and resurrection with Christ Jesus. Many times when we are born again, the enemy is not happy at all, for we are no longer his slave, but have been set free. He fights us with all he can to discourage us in this journey to experience the manifestations of our God-given inheritance. Sometimes believers might even think that it was better when they were in the world, just like the Israelites told Moses, at least we had food and water in Egypt. It is the enemy's plan to attack us with all he has so that we will return to be his slaves. Sometimes Christians might feel they had less attacks when they were in the world, but since they were born again, it is as if all hell broke loose. The children of Israel also experienced the same thing when they came out of Egypt. Pharaoh and all his army pursued them to kill them. Exodus 14 They thought they would all die there before the Red Sea by the hand of the Egyptians. But what we must realize is that even when we feel like we have reached the bottom, that our life and our children's lives are in danger, our business or source of income is about to be destroyed, God has placed a balustrade around us or placed a fence around us. Satan even complained to God about Job, saying, Have you not made a hedge or fence around about Job, around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Job 1 verse 10 The fence God has placed around you not only protects you on every side, but your entire household too, and all that you have, all your businesses, your employment, all your properties, etc. The enemy cannot touch you, because the fence of the Lord is around you. David knew that the Lord had put a fence around him, and he said, The angel of the Lord, who is Jesus Christ, Isaiah 63 verse 8 to 9, encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them, Psalm 34 verse 7. David had also reached the bottom. He knew the Lord Jesus encamped all around him to deliver him. He said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23 verse 4 David said, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Psalm 139 verse 7 to 10 David knew that he was only going through. He was not dwelling in that valley of the shadow of death. You and I might be going through some things, but we know that God is with us, and Jesus encamps around us to deliver us. His presence is, or His faces are with us, even when we make our bed in hell. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Psalm 34 verse 19 the prophet Zechariah said, For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, Jerusalem, and I will be the glory in her midst. Zechariah 2 verse 5 The enemy is kept outside the fence God has placed all around us. The Lord Jesus, your Redeemer, will arise and deliver you. Job said, I know my Redeemer Jesus lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. Job 19 verse 25 He will fight my battles. He will get me out of that valley of the shadow of death. He will provide for me in Rephidim. My children and I will not perish in Rephidim, nor will our source of income. Livestock Chapter 2 Jehovah Nissi the Lord is our banner. 
Many times when people say Jehovah Nissi, they only think about the God of war who gives them victories. Yes, the Lord is the man of war. Jehovah or Yahweh is his name. Exodus 15 verse 3. But the first meaning of Jehovah Nissi is the Lord our banner. But what banner? Is it the banner of one of the armies of Israel, lion, ox, man or eagle? This is what God says. His banner over us is love. Songs 2 verse 4 As long as we do not know it, we will not serve the Lord willingly. Not the love that we have for him, but the unconditional or agape love he has for us. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4 verse 19 Though the Lord has made us soldiers of Christ, he wants us to know that it is not because we can fight for his kingdom that he saved us, or because we can serve in his kingdom that he saved us. No, it is because he loves us. All these things we will do, but they do not commend us to God. He said, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. Hosea 14 verse 4 The thief on the cross with Jesus said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Verily I say to you, Today, you shall be with me in paradise. Luke 23 verse 42 to 43. The banner Jesus placed over him was love. The thief had never served Jesus on earth, had never fought any battle with the Lord to advance the kingdom of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die for us so that we will be victors in life, no longer victims. When the Hebrews were in captivity in Egypt, they could not defeat Pharaoh. They could not fight for their own freedom. But God, who is love, and placed the banner of love over them, said to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of that land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3 verse 7 to 8 God is our Father. Which father on earth, seeing his son or daughter being afflicted, crying night and day, will not come to them and deliver them or comfort them? God said to Moses, You shall say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But... If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. Exodus 4 verse 22 to 23 Israel could not fight for himself. God was the one who plagued Egypt with the ten plagues and then delivered Israel from the bondage of Pharaoh. It is the same thing for our salvation. As we explain in length in the Perfect Redemption Plan Part 1, how God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, defeated Satan, who was trying to hold us in bondage all those years and kept our inheritance. It was the blood of the Lamb that the Israelites put on their doorposts and lintels that caused the angel of death to pass over them. In other words, it was the death and the resurrection of the Lamb of God, Jesus, that delivered them from their captors. God gave them the victory over their arch-enemy Pharaoh because he loved them. Israel is his son. Now Pharaoh in Arabic means crocodile. The Hebrew word tanium means a marine or land monster, a serpent, a dragon, whale, crocodile, all reptiles. In Ezekiel 29.3, God says, Thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon, Tanyam, who lies in the midst of his rivers, who has said, My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. The Bible never used the name of the king of Egypt, but always called him Pharaoh. In the Nile River, they had crocodiles, so they called their king after that powerful crocodile, which is a cruel, voracious, and mischievous monster. So was Pharaoh to the people of the land, and especially to the Hebrews. God was prophetically telling the people that it is not the physical Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who has kept you in bondage, but the great dragon or serpent of old, your arch-enemy, Satan. I, the Lord, am against Satan, who is at work through Pharaoh. Jesus also came down from heaven to deliver us from the power of the dragon, because he so loved us. All the victories we ever had, and we will keep on having, are because God so loves us and decides to fight for us. He says the battle is not yours, but God's. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 15 I, the Lord, Jehovah, the man of war, Exodus 15 3, will fight on your behalf because I love you and my banner over you is love. Not only does God fight your battles, but he says the war is God's. 1 Chronicles 5 verse 22 He will fight not just one battle, but the entire war, until you experience the manifestations of the blessings of the promised land and have rest all around from your enemies. The Lord will drive out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one will be able to stand against you. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Joshua 23 verse 9 to 10 We do not have to beg God for him to fight our battles or wars. He promises to do so. All his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. We just need to ask him to come to our rescue. When we are born again, we have been spiritually delivered from the power of darkness, which is the equivalent of the bondage of Egypt, and translated to the kingdom of the Son of God's love, which is our spiritual promised land. Colossians 1 verse 13 We are not in a spiritual wilderness, even if physically we feel like we are in that spiritual wilderness. Paul tells us we walk by faith and not by sight. Greek word eidos, which means view, appearance, sight, physical senses. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 it is because people are walking by sight, or feelings, or appearances, that they think they are spiritually in the wilderness, walking to their promised land or Zion, and they come up with the songs like, We are marching up to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We are marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. It is because they are looking at their physical circumstances, and think they are in a wilderness spiritually. Paul tells us, You have come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Hebrews 12 verse 22 to 24. You are not marching up to Zion, but you have come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So, spiritually, every born-again Christian has been delivered from the power of darkness and been translated to the kingdom of the Son of God's love, even the promised land. 
We are not in a spiritual wilderness regardless of how we feel or how things appear in the physical. We are not in the spiritual wilderness marching up to the promised land. But we are in the promised land fighting the forces and powers of darkness that have illegally kept our possessions. We are living the book of Joshua, for Joshua is a type of Jesus who gave the people rest. Under the leadership of Joshua, the people stepped into the promised land and fought to utterly destroy all their enemies who occupied their promised land. Paul tells us, For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remains therefore a rest to the people of God, for he who has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Hebrews 4 verse 8 to 10 Spiritually, we are in Christ Jesus our rest. We have come to Mount Zion, our heavenly Jerusalem, our spiritual promised land. What we should pray is what Jesus told us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Luke 11 verse 2 We have seen spiritually that we are in the promised land. We need to pray that the promises God made to us of that land flowing with milk and honey be done on earth here as it is in the spiritual realm. If you do not understand that Christ Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Sabbaths and is our ultimate rest, and for the Hebrews it was entering the promised land, you will still be thinking that you are in a wilderness spiritually. We have a better covenant in the blood of Christ Jesus. Our fight is against the powers and forces of darkness that are occupying our promised land. To be continued.